this week on To the Contrary. First, questionable ethics, separating the Trump White House from the Trump brand, then giving Senator Warren a megaphone. Behind the headlines, healing relationships damaged by the 2016 elections. Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, the Trump family and brand marketing. First Lady Melania Trump filed a $150 million lawsuit against the owner of the Daily Mail, claiming the online news site defamed her in an article that included allegations about the First Lady's past. The lawsuit argues the article damaged Mrs. Trump's, quote, unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity which could have garnered multi-million dollar business relationships, end quote. And after Nordstrom's announced it was dropping first daughter Ivanka Trump's fashion line, the president took to Twitter with a message that the department store treated his daughter unfairly. The tweet appeared on his personal Twitter account as well as at POTUS. Then, White House counselor Kellyanne Conway plugged Ivanka's clothing on the Fox News channel. It's just, it's a wonderful line. I own some of it. I fully, I'm going to just give it, I'm going to give a free okay. commercial here. Go buy it today, everybody. You can <laughs> right. find it online. Then it was revealed this week, President Trump's son Eric socked an almost $100,000 bill to the taxpayers for Secret Service protection on a business trip to Uruguay to plug a Trump Organization property. Ethics experts claim this is a clear case where government agencies are forced to pay to support business operations that ultimately help to enrich the president himself. So, Patrice, I'm scratching my head as I ask you this question, but what are female Trump voters thinking as they watch this procession of ethical violations? I mean, I think they're concerned. But then let's get back to the real reason why they voted for Trump. And it was not because of ethics. It was because they are concerned about the unemployment with their husbands and their sons. I think ethics is definitely not involved for why people voted for Trump. But I would say that this is a win for consumers and purchasing power. And we're seeing heroes emerge from bureaucrats and lawyers and the everyday buyer. Well, I'm going to echo Patrice's statements and just say, you know, we, we, we're kind of in a whole new area now where we weren't used to a business person coming in. So we're just uncharted territory in a lot of ways. Well, just like Trump said he could shoot someone in the head and people would still support him, this is yet another example of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, this is, as, as a trained lawyer, I look at what's going on here and I cannot believe it. Kellyanne, who was a regular panelist on the show for 20 years, sitting in front of the White House logo, pushing a brand and he said he was going to clean drain the swamp the swamp is now an ocean because of all <laughs> the extra crap that has that he's put into it it's not a good look um but you know it's it's amazing pew talked but, to but why aren't there consequences anybody else any other president would have fired a, a you know a, a so-called advisor counselor who did something like that on the spot this is corrupt this is self, you I know. Do you have I another think, example of that happening? I mean, I think no, Trump because nobody's ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's There's the never thing. been a White House like, like this before. Right. We were in it's uncharted. Illegal. We don't know. Like, we d haven't had someone straight from a business coming into the White House. It was always going to be difficult. And the Eric Trump this is situation, he has. This is self, this is using yeah. your government position to enrich yourself or your friends. It's a clear ethical violation. I'm not even sure how he would be able to completely get away from his business. He has so many A blind trust, which he refuses to do. Yeah. There's clear uh, you know, even there, he, he and releasing his taxes. And releases his taxes. Let me just tell you, he, he, Kellyanne did, I'm sure, what her boss told her to do. That's why she's not fired. He did exactly what he wanted her to do. What, she, what he wanted her to do. When you look at his person. specific, when, well, clearly, when she's on TV, she knows that he's watching. 
and she knows that she needs to keep him happy and that's what he wants to hear when you saw his reaction to what happened with Nordstrom's which actually it was a business decision because I know if I see something with Trump on in the store I'm certainly not buying well it, it was also grab your wallet has been after all the stores yeah. who mm -hmm. care right. and, and that you, you know is, is a is a bigger well a, a business decision uh, on, on, on consumers. Yeah, because on, they, because on, on they're, they're responding to their because, clients. Right, yeah, that's fine. They're telling them I'm not Absolutely. buying at your place until you you know, drop yeah. her brand, and it wasn't selling. And I think that's one of the things that, you, I mean, I, I continue to look for the silver linings that we're seeing post-elections, and I do think the accountability, you know, regardless of who and how and where, is one of those silver linings. And again, you know, the rule of law is an example, but also the power of consumers. And, you know, particularly as Americans, we've always criticized ourselves for being so consumer-driven. It's nice to see how consumer power is now doing what people perceive to be good work through social justice. I I think it's really misplaced. I mean, we're boycotting Ivanka Trump because she supports her father. I'm always going to support my father. And so then people are going to attack me and not just him. And I think that's really, that is kind of unfair. Yeah, but uh, I mean, until he puts everything he owns in a blind trust, do you want do you want to keep seeing more ethical violations rising against him? This is going to dog him his entire presidency. No, it's absolutely. Many good. times a day, every day. No, you know, many times a day, but I do think that there's going to be a lot of problems with his children being so close and running the business because in the Eric Trump situation, he has secret service. So he, if he's still doing stuff with the business, then that's going to be secret service taxpayers paying for things. And that's something that needs to be looked into. And we need to figure this all out. And Trump has to be willing to go along with it. I'm just saying again, we really haven't dealt with this before. And so there's going to be stumbles. There's going to be new things to learn. And we can't always always just assign the worst implications and motives to Trump. Are conservative women concerned? I mean, look at the Melania Trump situation. She sues a blogger mm -hmm. saying that because he wrote something about... Called her an Trump, escort. An yeah. escort that she, Well, anyway, she, um, she, she said that that denied her a marketing opportunity. Well, She's looking at the first ladies. Uh, position as a marketing opportunity. That doesn't bother conservative women? I mean, I, I think the administration has gone back and said that that was misunderstood in the in the lawsuit itself, but... Well, everything they, do, they don't like is they misunderstood have and, have and they have to misinterpret, reinterpret it. But I think, I mean, when it comes to conservative women, you know, my original point was they, when they elected Donald Trump, they were thinking about their husbands and sons who have, or blue, who are blue-collar workers. How about themselves? Seen, well, and they're tied to their families. They've seen their family incomes fall. They've seen economic mobility tradition so hard to do. When Pew interviewed Americans at the end of December and then again in b the beginning of January, the concern over these uh, these issues dropped from 65 percent to about 57 percent. So Americans are not as concerned. Now we can see what's going to happen for the month of February given all of these issues. But I think people at the end of the day want to know whether the president can deliver on his promises, particularly to get them back to to work. You know, when he came into office, uh, the the December unemployment dropped from from 4.9 to 4.8 percent, which is below you know, anything below five is wonderful because it, you're not going to get much lower than that. Um, so we left with an administration who got the unemployment de rate down after the Great Recession, who had not one. People don't talk about this, but not one ethical violation <laughs> of eight years in office because everybody was screened and people who violated rules were fired. Mm -hmm. So um, what are you thinking? Yeah, I bet you people are missing no drama Obama right about now. <laughs> this has been nothing but nonstop drama. Uh, since this administration has been in the White House. And we're not even talking about the Russian drama that's still out there, that is being investigated, but for some reason uh, is not really taking You mean up. about the uh, hacking the election? Not only the hacking, but the apparent ties between the Russians and his campaign operatives. Uh, and there are investigations that are going on right now around that, and it's not really getting a lot of pickup uh, in the media, unfortunately, right now, because there's so many other things. Every day he has another tweet that's going out. Every day he has another executive order that's going out. I mean. So much is happening. This is real life chaos theory in practice. And so all of these other very, very important issues that really go to really whether or not our, our nation has been co-opted by hostile foreign a government is actually being glossed over because we're distracted by Ivanka Trump's shoes.
uh, your thoughts very quickly. Please. I think, again, for the silver lining, like there are so many things that are testing us both as a society and as people and our constitution and rule of law. And the only way that we can rise to the challenge is to really find ways to work together as a society, as a government, and as a community. And I, I think that we're beginning to see new ways of doing that. All right. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter, at Bonnie Urbe, or at To The Contrary. From White House ethics to Republican leaders censoring Senator Elizabeth Warren. Former Senator Jeff Sessions was sworn in this week as Attorney General. Senate debate over his nomination may have boosted Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren's standing as a feminist leader. She was silenced on the Senate floor while reading a letter by the late Coretta Scott King. Mrs. King wrote the letter opposing Sessions' nomination to a federal judgeship in 1986. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell claims Warren was in direct violation of Senate Rule 19, which says essentially senators cannot impugn each other. Democratic senators and activists took to Twitter in defense of Warren, creating the hashtag Let Liz Speak, and she persisted. Warren continued her speech on Facebook Live, gaining close to 3 million views. And of course it rose... That was three million views while it was live, and it's since been viewed by many millions more. But um, she's on the list of potential female presidential candidates for 2020. Did this boost her standing or, or lower it? I think it boosted, um, you know, particularly between a uh, demographic that's already, you know, sympathetic to the Democrats. And I think there was some concern about her um, vote on Ben Carson and others. So it helped kind of put her back in the front lines and to the limelight and really was a rallying cry for women across. Because people opposed that she supported Ben Carson? Uh, well, she had not voted, yeah. Your thoughts? Another distraction from uh, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, I, I, she. No, let's get the facts straight. She was going on a lengthy, lengthy speech for 30 minutes. She was warned, and then she continued to relent. Um, I, I don't find that she is a, a civil rights hero, which I think by reading the speech, maybe she's trying to make that connection. I think she was just um, bringing a lot more discord and a lot of rhetoric to the to the floor of the Senate. And you know, I I, I found Lindsay, that Lindsey Graham said afterwards that the that the Senate censoring of her was, quote, long overdue. And it does it look to you at all like a bunch of guys getting angry at a woman who has a has a mouth and uses it? Only if uh, the six other female senators did not vote with the other 43 uh, other senators to 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 censor her because she was wrong. So, I mean, if we, if we want to talk about female senators who disagreed with her and, and her diatribe, then I think, um, you know, it's it's a fair assessment to say that she was going on too far and she was just using it as a political platform to raise her perspective and her her um, her her status who the person who is a legitimate civil rights hero is Coretta Scott King and she was specifically interrupted reading the cover letter to Coretta Scott King's 10 page uh, written testimony the last time that Sessions up was for, was up for nomination in terms of this federal judicial and, and so um, you know what happened here uh, is that I, I take personal offense uh, that uh, she was stopped in relaying the very real concerns that Coretta Scott King expressed previously, which is relevant to someone who will be the highest sort of voice of law in the land moving forward. And that to me is what I think got a lot of people ruffled, at least I know it got me ruffled, and it's one of the reasons why people took such offense. He didn't just stop her when she was saying anything. She was, she was specifically reading what was already in congressional record because that had already been submitted. And and so one could even question even if the rule that he imposed was actually correct because she was just reading what was already in the record. And there um, were record. male senators after her who went to read the rest of the letter yeah. and they weren't censored. Right, Absolutely. because let's go back to relaying the facts. She had originally been writing, uh, reading from Ted Kennedy who called Sessions a disgrace. She was warned to stop. She went in with Coretta uh, Scott King and it wasn't the entire letter. That's why the male senators were allowed to read more of the letter because they picked up where she left off. They were particularly uh, incensed by one passage where Coretta Scott King wrote that Jeff Sessions um, was using his office in order to keep blacks from voting. And that's true. That was the, Im that was the impu 
that that's an interpretation, and that was what they that's, were warned on. You know, the male it, senators it. didn't read those sections again. That's why they were not censored. So this whole idea that it was Coretta Scott King who was censored was that passage. It wasn't her entire statement. It wasn't her entire letter. It was passage, that passage. It was in her statement. Absolutely. The passage was in her statement. It was and, just and, part know, of her. It wasn't her entire statement. What, I understand uh, I that. That's irrelevant. That's irrelevant that, 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 that it was just part of no, 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 wait. One at a time. What, we don't have much time left. What are African Americans thinking now that Jeff Sessions is Attorney General? It's a very dangerous time because he, actually Coretta Scott King's le letter was specifically going to his activist um, sort of action against voting rights. And that's something that is still under attack in America. It's also concerning because we have several It was big North Carolina in, Absolutely. in this North past Carolina, election. Absolutely. North Carolina, Florida. I mean, you can just go on and on. Wisconsin. Uh, but in addition to that, we have several cities that are under consent decrees. And we have uh, someone in office who is talking about law and order, who is talking about uh, stop and frisk. And then we have someone in the Justice Department, which is supposed to be the last line of defense between an overreaching government and the citizens. And we've already seen that this president has no patience for someone who has the gall to stand up against him in favor of the Constitution. He basically put a yes man in the Department of Justice, and that to me is a threat to justice in this nation, period. What are conservative just, black Americans thinking about it? I, I think they're thinking about li those who are in, si in cities that are overrun with violence for decades are worried about, you know, in ensuring that law enforcement is restored and, and that people are, you know, arrested where needs be. The pun I mean, civil criminal justice reform isn't still an issue that I think a lot of uh, black conservatives worry about it and reach across the aisle on. What about voting rights? I, I think everyone agrees that everyone should be able to vote and um, and you know I mean black conservatives certainly uh, agree with that position. Right they agree with that position but is that what the kind of justice department that uh, Sessions is going to run where he's going when there are calls for shutting down uh, voting rights is he going to enforce that or you mean asking ban people to show a photo ID to prove who they are yes yeah, whatever the requirements are I, I mean I think we we want to ensure that the Justice Department is 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 ensuring that everyone who is qualified to vote who is uh, depending on the state law is able to vote is voting it that that there isn't voter fraud I mean I, I think to paint all blacks with the same brush uh, and perspective is is the wrong is is not well accurate. Trump did Trump did win nine percent of the Black vote and uh, Hillary Clinton won 90 percent. So it's not too far off the mark to uh, say the majority, the way majority of African Americans are are not in support of this president. No, oh, no, that would definitely be the case. <laughs> it would definitely so, be the case. Oh, the blacks, as he would say. <laughs> Behind the headlines: polarizing politics and personal relationships. According to a Reuters Ipsos poll, the presidential election has strained, even fractured, relationships between couples, family members, and friends. 16% of those polled said they stopped talking to a family member or close friend. 13% ended a relationship. We have this network of a couple of thousand therapists, and we are online with them. And it's really the case that they are all talking to each other about how they are dealing with the, the impact of the political situation on the couples. And that is one of the most disturbing things that couples are bringing in the office now. It's, it's kind of surprising to me because as, when I was active, nobody ever had a conflict much over politics. They had conflict over sex or, you know, or money or stuff like that. But politics? Relationship experts Dr. Harville Hendricks, his wife and partner, Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt, says differences are real, but couples, friends, even family can get past them and learn to connect in other ways. How I share my view of things can either end up with two people connected in difference, or it, it can shut them down. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. You can bring up any issue, but in a way that doesn't make your, the person listening feel put down. And if that's moving more into, you know, shifting from judgment to curiosity. If you want to stay polarized, then argue about who's right. If you want to connect, then you have to accept each other's difference. Dr. Hendricks created Imago Relationship Therapy, a structured way of listening to someone else, summarizing what they said, even asking if they have more to say, and then taking turns sharing perspectives. Participants often start out being resistant 
to a formulaic style of conversation. Oh yeah, it's like, I don't want the structure. So we say, well, how, how is not, it's like Dr. Phil says, well, how's the way you're doing it working for you? <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's not. Once people experience it, they love the structure because it's safe. Oh, yes. I mean, right. it's just like that. Everyone goes, thank God. At last, I know I can count on the other listening to me. The structured approach works because of the general principles of brain science. One of the great insights in neuroscience is you can't change your first thought, but you can change your second. And that's very empowering because if, our, if someone says something and we're reactive, well, we're going to let them have it and we're going to tell them how we feel. But it's from that lower brain. This structure forces you out of the lower brain into your upper brain. Up here, this part of the brain, the neocortex, you can problem solve mm -hmm. and collaborate <clears throat> and cooperate. Down here, the reactive part of the brain is it's my way or the highway. Like you, you need to see my point of view or you just, you're an idiot. You know, mm -hmm. how can anyone take your point of view. But the upper brain, you may very much disagree at the end, but you don't have to have split and damaged your relationship just because you believe in you have a different political perspective than the other. I get, Manal, that in the world you live in, which is religion, women, uh, empowerment and, and such, um, that you are very accepting of other people's positions because your job has trained you to be that way. Um, do you agree with how, with what they're saying to get across, you know, the, obviously couples where one voted for Hillary and one for Trump, uh, you know, you could see where that would be a very difficult thing to live through. A absolutely, and, I, and I'm, I'm smiling because um, it triggers something in me. You know, one of the things that I realized, um, one of my first memories of when I realized my marriage was failing was over a conversation over Trayvon Martin. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't think I can live with this person any longer. Um, so it, you know, no matter what your training is, it's not a matter of right or wrong. Um, when I look at the elections and the conversations that are happening with people, who, you know, I grew up in South Carolina and know a lot of people who voted for Trump. And one of the most difficult things is I just need them to see me, not talk politics, but see that I'm planning to expecting to be in a camp if things continue the way they're going and that's a real fear don't dismiss my fear because there's a lot of legal precedents that would allow for it to happen under national security so i think it's not just a matter of right or wrong and understanding i think it's really seeing people the same way you're talking about people wanting jobs and income we need to see that part too and i think when we're able to see each other's pain and i really believe that pain that isn't transformed is transferred and i think that's what's happening post-election cycle Right, and, and people do need to remember, why did you like someone before politics? I mean, I see all these messages on Facebook. That I've defriended all these people. I've been muting some people that are just nonstop acrimony on Facebook. I've been muting them, but I don't want to delete them because, you know, like, we were friends before all of this. Like, I have one person that is constantly just this shoving out the worst things, and I just remember, you know what? We, we were in high school together, we were in theater. I still love him. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to like cut him out of my life because of his political views and because of his fears. You know, and I think more people need to just accept that the person might not be the worst person in the world because you liked them once for one reason. That part of them's still there. So what do you say, let's just, you know, I, I still love you. But let's not talk politics. Yeah, sometimes it works in marriage. Um, you know, what's funny is when I had a good friend who we disagree ve vehemently on politics, but when I heard that she was in a car accident, politics went out the window. It was about her and that relationship. And if, if we can get back to that point where we are just individuals and we love one another, then we, politics will come and go. You know, the rhetoric comes and goes, but we can treat with each other with respect and, and remember that. Yeah, it, that that is certainly something to aspire to. I think that the thing that makes this particular circumstance different is that this particular uh, individual is uber divisive and very offensive and very hateful in a lot of the things that he says and that sort of uh, explanation I keep of the getting brain. emails comparing him to Hitler yeah I mean, and that he that you know by scholars yeah and um, that he slept with a, a, a book 
you know, one of Hitler's books by his bed for many years in well, the 90s. I mean, you know, I'm not surprised to hear that, but it's very funny. Listening to the, the explanation of where, what happens in your brain, exactly the neuroscience of everything, makes me think that maybe Trump lives in the back of his brain because everything seems to be, it's my way or the highway. And having such a sort of volatile perspective on everything, I think seeps down into the broader have culture. Have you cut off friends because of... Um, I, you know, I, ha I have, I have, and I, you know, I'm dating, I'm not married, but I would not, for example, I would not imagine, I could not even imagine dating a Trump supporter. There's nothing that I could imagine really even having to talk with that person about, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Do you feel the same way? I think it's more important than ever to speak to Trump supporters. I'm actually going out of my way to go back to where I grew up, which is in Spartanburg, and my, the rest of my family's in Bettendorf, Iowa, and I haven't been back in a long time, so I'm really trying to reach out. Um, but because I believe it's important for us to really address this issue, and it's not about people. All right, that's it for this edition. Please, allow, please follow me on Twitter and visit our website. Whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.